Okay. Okay, we're in part two here of the interview. And uh, Ian was talking about tourism, basically. He got kind of cut off there a little bit. And um, I was mentioning Blake and... Um, Blake, Blake. William Blake. Yeah, Blake. Yeah. Because he didn't go anywhere. And you were talking about how, how um, you know, people like, it seems like, you know, when we were young, you, you know, there'd be like Laker Airlines or P over here and you had PSA. It was, and then, but now it seems like everybody's, you know, they'll just fly all the time, you know, like to, it's cheaper to fly to like a different country in Europe than, then, and people, people that went to the World Cup this year just didn't even stay in Qatar. You know, they stayed in a nearby country and just flew in for the game and came out because it was cheaper to stay at a hotel in Italy or somewhere. You know, it's it's really encouraged. Uh, tourism's really encouraged. You know, and yeah, no, it's 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 not only encouraged. It's it's the rigor to be like a real person. You're supposed to constantly, you know, and there's always a new place. It's like, oh well. Are you on the Malfi Coast? Are you in Greece? Are you blah, blah, blah? You know, this influencer culture of kind of with this mind control, you know, this fascist, you know, kind of dictum of how you have to be, you know, exist. And uh, it's just completely insane. And, um, and, you know, so basically the book is just proposing that there's an aspect of tourism which maybe is just a form of imperialism where the soldier, the occupying soldier has to pay their own, their own way in the neoliberal, you know, in the neoliberal tradition, you know, like when the neoliberal, when neoliberalism started, the idea was like, it's essentially just getting for, you know, it's like, it's the idea of, you know, one aspect of neoliberalism is this free labor, you know, paradigm so for example magazines you know just operate on interns and contributors you know unpaid contributors you know it's like there's no more you know there's you know if you're a photographer you don't get paid anymore you're just like oh well this is a great opportunity for you because there's so many young people and it's really been really enabled by the the you know the internet and just uh you know our individual insignificance as per the internet everybody sees how replaceable they are because there's like a thousand people just like you doing exactly what you do and you know who are maybe even more beautiful so in, in chapter three yeah yeah there's a it's like a play almost it's you get you go into a different form you do a J, J, james joycean move where you just everything it's like all of a sudden you're it's like theater and like there's a chapter about songwriting and you're in like some kind of camp and why why did you decide to write these uh kind of plays that kind of like can be performed and and stuff why did you do that in the in the third chapter of the book it, it totally changed forms there oh well well that was actually that's just uh that was just really a lecture that i gave um oh, right. And, uh, you know, and I just thought it was so brilliant that I thought I should uh, in include it. Uh, it's basically about um, just, you know, strategies for songwriting. And, um, you know, when I was growing up in uh, the punk scene, you know, nobody knew how to do anything. We were like, completely stupid. And nobody knew even what a song, like we all listened to music, but there was a, there was less of a kind of understanding of songwriting you know, of, you know, there, you know, I'm from a generation that was really not educated. You know, we were kind of just, we were just like left to our own imagination, you know, or whatever. It was like kind of get, go run in, you know, go run in the street, you know, it was before the millennial thing, which was, you know, I mean, if we're going to use these, you know, whatever pop terms of, you know, generational terms, you know, it's, it was, it was, People were operating on the Benjamin Spock idea that like children are just just leave them to be savages. They should just be sa you know savages. There was this idea of the Rizzoian natural man. You know, if you see uh, Jim Morrison, Iggy Pop were kind of like they were kind of proposing. You know, that there's that whole '60s idea of the the natural man, the Rizzoian natural man, that that civilization corrupts. 
So the kids born after that were for one generation, they were really encouraged to just be absolutely savage. You know, don't teach the kid anything. Don't make them make their bed. Don't teach them anything. Don't, you know, so that's kind of the generation I was, I was from. And then later then the, you know, then the kids born in the Reagan era were, you know, that there's this new traditionalism, you know, that was like, oh, well, actually, you know, we have to, you know, and that's kind of ramped up. And now kids are just these incredible polymaths, you know, like when you meet a kid who was born in the nineties, I mean, they can do anything. They, they're like, they're typically scientists, they're aero, they're aeronautic physics geniuses. Like they can do the lithograph, they can do anything and they play 20 instruments. I mean, it's completely insane, but my generation, we didn't know how to do anything. We were completely yeah. idiotic. Yeah. And anyway, so, so for me writing, about songwriting was like that was just what I've learned about songwriting and because I was never taught anything you know because I'm from this generation where we weren't taught yeah there's all these Japanese girl nine-year-old girls that play every Jimi Hendrix solo and it's like how the hell they do that you know what's going on here I yeah but we could have done it you know but we were we were they didn't want to corrupt our pure our purity yeah it's yeah. kind of like these people who, you know, get a dog, like a stray dog, and then they're like, oh, well, the dog is so charming. I'm going to let it, you know, piss <laughs> on the dog. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of the, what my generation was, you know. But, yeah, you have to have some sort of. And that's, that's, the, that's the hardcore generation. Essentially. You have to have an idea, you know. Yeah, I guess. So in chapter four, I mean, you kind of talk about Instagram a little bit. A lot, a lot of younger people. Like maybe like yeah, like you said, born in after nineteen ninety, you think the internet is a way to express themselves, or you know they can. It's all about free speech. But I mean, in this chapter, I mean, you kind of like tell them that hey, you know, who owns these these uh, systems? You know, it's corporations. You know, they they got you. You can say anything on Twitter or this or that, but. Who, who's making the money off your ideas or whatever? Well, you can say anything you want, but you know that there's, there's, but it's a, you know, it's sort of like you will be hired or fired according to that too. You know, there's a kind of thing, you know, when during this pandemic thing, when all the, there was an enormous wealth transfer, a lot of businesses were being gobbled up by other businesses. And, you know, that was one of the main things when the new businesses were taking over the old businesses that they they would call the herd based on, you know, the Twitter feed or whatever. So if you said something about, you know, whatever, you know, you know, if you said something that was impolitic, according to the hegemony at the moment, then you weren't going to get hired from the new, you know, the new boss wasn't going to take you on. So, so that's one thing, but the, but the, the article is actually proposing the idea that Instagram was a way for people to express themselves as a corporation. So it's oh, basically right. a response to this Supreme Court ruling that was um that said that corporations were people. So if you look at the you know the Supreme Court made a historic ruling. They said it was, you know, whatever it was, I have the dates in, in the article, but they said corporations are people. So by the law of symmetry the inviolable law of symmetry that means that people are also corporations right so nine months literally nine months after the supreme court decision that pronounced corporations as people instagram was born and instagram is the way for the people the the corporate body of the people to express themselves as individual products or brands and that's really what we've become since the advent of Instagram, much more, you know, before that, everybody was encouraged to have their own web page or to do Facebook or MySpace or whatever. But Instagram is really the one that really consolidated this corporate brand personality thing. And people even talk about it without irony now. They're like, oh, well, that's not really, you know, like they'll talk about some person and they'll be like, yeah, that's not consistent with their brand. You know, so people, People have turned themselves into brands. They're really aware of being brands. But the funny thing about the brands is that there's this, you know, consumer aspect of the likes and the 
followers, but none of it translates into money except for the Uber brand and the idea and the capitalism, the idea that people are these brands that can be phased out or exalted or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like so it's it's yeah, it's all really sinister and weird. Yeah, I mean, but still the corporations are making all the money off these people, you know, like because they're they, they own they own the uh, platform, you know, so they so they you own know. all the, they own everything, the content, the images, and everybody like with punk, everybody, um, everybody is actually doing kind of labor for these corporate, you know, like we're all just creating, we're innovating in a kind of free lab laboratory, you know, we're doing the research and development for their stuff, their product. Do you know what I mean? Like, so if you're particularly clever on Instagram, it's not going unnoticed, you know, people are just gobbling it up, you know, and everybody, you know, in the old days, every, you know, that was kind of a, a conceit that everybody had. Oh, well, we're being, we're being watched and we're being surveyed and they're copying us. And that was all true. But now it's now there's not even any question. It's just like, yeah, that's what's that's that that is that's what's happening, you know. And and it's it's another thing that makes it impossible for a subculture to exist because the subculture can't, you know, it used to be the subculture would exist for a while and then it would get appropriated and co-opted. But now there's like the subculture can't really even yeah, it gets it gets taken up for three weeks and then it's pretty much forgotten. You know, the like they kind of like or or can it even be a subculture? Because if you're inviting everybody in the world into your culture, then can it be a subculture? You know, like there's this is you know like there was just this article in the Guardian about this Israeli you know you know bot farm you know that you hire and they create and they they control like. 100,000 profiles that will, all, you know, comment on this and that. So, you know, all this kind of, you know, bot frenzy of, you know, this idea of consensus, all this consensus that we're responding to about like who's good and who's bad and what's wrong and what's right. All of it is being manipulated by these corporations that are farming out bots and, you know, fake people, fake profiles. You know, I mean, that's, it's just the rea it's the reality. Elon Musk even said it when he was buying Twitter. He's like, well, this is all fake people. Like, I don't, you know, this product is a, is a sham. You know, this this thing that's supposed to be this, this, you know, village town hall or something. This it's supposed to be a town hall, but it's actually people by bots who are, you know, being manipulated by these yeah, but commercial and political interests. So none of none of the kind of consensus or the or the you know the likes you know oh everybody loves you know Saint Vincent or whoever it is you know it's like well you know you can't believe anything that's being proposed. Well, okay, so in chapter five you kind of talk about Frankenstein. It's kind of like the. I mean, no offense to Saint Vincent. I just. Oh yeah, yeah. Just somebody a, just said Saint Vincent. Example, yeah, yeah. It, it's like, and then the the machines like go on that word and they they kind of amplify it you know and and kind of like yeah, or whatever like, i mean it's just like the matrix it's, it's the propaganda is just more crazy than it's ever been you know so so when i read the read your uh chapter about frankenstein it's kind of like the modern man has become like frankenstein you know because we're derooted from you know the you know the, we don't really have like a local punk scene or a local poetry scene or whatever you know it's 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 we're all like playing to the middle we're all playing to a national international audience you know and the, yeah. and we we don't really we don't really have that connection to our place or religion because like you know cause i feel things have been real sec or have been secular for a long time you know like you know there's kind of like people get into religion but it's not very serious i don't think it's it, ever, ever since like the Time magazine, God is dead, seventy one. I mean, things have been kind of secular. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I was born in sixty four, so I, I felt a little bit of the old Catholic uh, school traditional education, but uh, you know, 
it felt like by 75 it felt like god was like gone you know it was you know nobody ever talked about that stuff unless you went to yeah. religious school or something or were depressed or something but uh you know frankenstein so frankenstein's kind of like the you know everybody's like a frankenstein now we we just kind of like we, we we're not really that connected to the family because that's you know we're not really connected to the religion the place so we're just kind of like this um collage we're all like a collage artist you know it's like it's like and, and yeah. we have all these uh platforms to kind of like um make up stuff about ourselves and kind of offer ourselves up to the world as a brand or a like uh this person and 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 you know because that's what it takes you know and yeah you you're like you know like frankenstein we're always trying to reanimate ourselves like through different personas or whatever yeah well the frankenstein chapter is a play and it's like it's actually about it's kind of um talking about just the narrative of you know the modern documentary because i'm really against these documentaries i think they're really cheap they're propagandistic they're really patronizing and they they're they're this kind of selective information that's just you know manipulates the viewer into some kind of historical proposal that's already you know that's predetermined you know like a classic documentary something like you know don't look back or uh uh or the Maysles brothers um you know uh Beatles for CS visit it's like they're just showing you things that happen and there's obviously a very editorial you know there's obviously the director and the ed editor and they you know they're obviously proposing certain things but they're not it's not this kind of really moralistic propagandistic mo you know this morality tale that the modern documentary always has to give us with this bullshit struggle, you know, this kind of the struggle of the heroic artist or the, you know what I mean, or whatever it is. And it's gotten quite disgusting, you know, with these, you know, just the fascination with Jeffrey Dahmer or something, you know, like, like, like these documentaries, they're really disgusting. And I really think they're like poison. I think they're like cultural poison. And the uh, Frankenstein, uh, play that I wrote is just a, kind of a spoof of this kind of incredibly patronizing, uh, you know, documentary propaganda. Yeah, but but uh, in, in that way, I mean, they they make these documentaries, they 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 these fictitious uh, stories to kind of establish the order, you know, from the top down, you know. Exactly, it's like this. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it's really nefarious because it's about you know telling us what's important in history you know like there's some new you know i don't know there's some new strokes documentary you know it's like the i don't you know just all of them i mean like it's just and there's so much revisionism in them you know i mean like don't look back which is a great film don't look back bob dylan don't look back it's you know there's nothing they're just you know they're filming something they're proposing this okay the it's obviously doc heavily doctored but there's no, they're not telling you like, oh, there's nothing, you know, there's not all these talking heads. There's not all this kind of, you know, incredibly, I mean, I think one aspect of modern politics, if you want to call them that, especially particularly what's called the woke ideology, is that everybody's become a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's, there's really no, there's no respect for the viewer, for the listener, or for anybody to, you know, because there's just, this is right and this is wrong, and I'm going to talk to you like you're a three-year-old. And it's really unbelievable. And that's kind of what these documentaries are like. What do you think of that? Um, yeah, well, the Strokes documentary, I mean, it left, I mean... It left I didn't see it. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I have Showtime, so I saw it. And, uh, you know, I, I was actually, it was originally going to be a four-part uh tv thing for hbo or something and i was i was contacted because i interviewed interpol and the walkman and a lot of those bands and when i saw their the final project i mean it was basically just some old footage with no no talking heads and just um 
you know, just it was only only kind of focused on four or five bands. I mean, you know, Jonathan Fire Eater was like the kind of the big band in that whole scene at the beginning, you know, like when I remember my memory, they, that was like the band. They were, they, and even in the book, you know, Jonathan Fire Eater is mentioned. I think there's a chapter on them because they they had signed to DreamWorks and they were like this big band that was going to make it. And yeah, they, they were kinda, they were supposed to be the Strokes. Yeah, they were supposed to be the Strokes exactly, and they they had that whole and uh, yeah, Stewart and you know it was uh, I you know yeah, I know it's like it's a real sad story. And I mean, there's a lot of sad stories. I mean, a lot of people are not no longer with us from that whole scene. Uh, you know, TV and the radio or Secret Machines, I thought were like really great bands. Yeah, and some other other bands didn't get any attention at all, or 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 some bands that maybe aren't that good maybe get too much attention maybe in the but but when, well, the new york scene it probably lasted six months because i remember going to london in 2000 and then i came back and you know it was like all these articles about the strokes or like the best new york band i'm going who are these guys and nobody had heard about them in new york yeah and well, you really see the that that thing that happened is maybe the last gasp of the british, yeah. the british the british tabloids kind of calling the shots that was like their last hurrah you well, know because, well, because Jeff, that was before the internet took over and and pitchfork started became the kingmakers you know because that was the, the the last time that they were able to go like this band that you've never heard of is the most important band and really muscle a group into like stardom and like you know, because after that, it was the same thing, but it was this, uh, these, you know, these bearded people in Chicago, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it was basically Jeff Travis from Rough Trade, like, saying, hey, look at these guys. They look like Welcome Back Cotter, you know. They're important. And let's put them on the cover of Time Out or something. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, in, okay, so in Chapter 6, you kind of talk about how the audience, you know, in music... I mean, it's all about the audience now, you know, they're all, they, I mean, I, I don't know if this is for you, but I remember being in sixth grade and me and this one other guy knew Alice Cooper's Billion Dollar Babies. Like we were like the only two people that even knew the album existed. Like, yeah. And, uh, you know, and then when punk rock happened a couple years later, you know, like I, I dressed up like the Ramones for Halloween and nobody in my school even know what the hell that I was like. What the hell is going on? You know, they go, what, "What's this guy with the ripped pants? You know, what's going on? What is he doing?" Yeah. But now it's like everybody you know, thinks they have an opinion on music. You know, it's all because it's and you know they're taking pictures of themselves at concerts and stuff. And you know, and it's just you know at least half of the audience is just there to drink alcohol anyway. You know, it's like maybe, I mean, is that everyone's a music fan all of a sudden? You know, I, that's not my experience. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, does, does uh, everyone have, you know, the Silver Apples record or something or some weird shit, you know? Yeah, like, like everybody's very sophisticated. You're right. Yeah, yeah like, it's, it's, oh, it's ludicrous. Everybody knows. I mean, this is this is one thing that's really, this is one of the most striking characteristics of now as opposed to then. And that, this is one thing that it's just really interesting. It's like, well, you used to learn about the Beatles or whoever, the big band, whatever the big band. And then you would learn about these other things, maybe based on clues. Oh, well, they covered a Buck Owens song. They covered a Larry Williams song. They covered a Sherelle song. So then maybe you'd learn about that. And then that would lead you to these other things, blah, blah, blah. So there was this idea of like the dominant force and that that would lead you to these things. So it even happened with Nirvana, you know, where Nirvana name dropped all these post-punk bands and everybody learned about those post-punk bands from Nirvana. But with the digital paradigm, people are discovering the most obscure thing first, you know? So that's a really interesting thing, you know? So people know, people are hip to the inflatable boy clams before they hear the Rolling Stones, you know? That's, so that's really wild, you know? Because in terms of culture, and cultural influence it just it's really like it's just a really 
I, I know it's just really interesting, basically. Yeah, I mean, my own personal experience. I remember my parents' record collection. They had a because I lived in San Francisco when I was younger. We had like a Creedence Clearwater re revival. You know, the Rolling a couple Rolling Stones records, a couple Beatles records, a Grateful Dead record. You know, the, like I would just look. I didn't, you know, when you're like really young, you don't even realize that music is something that people do. You know, they just kind of these records just kind of exist. You know, you kind of go through your record collect their collection like look at every cover and go oh i wonder what this one is what wonder, wonder what santana sounds like yeah and then at some point you go hey there's guys that are closer to my age that do music and so you get into different bands and then you kind of like find your own way and like through you know literature like i discovered william s burroughs on my own and it wasn't really kind of like my dad's taste and you know writing or anything you know and yeah. I, I, told, I told my dad, I go, yeah, you know, like in 77 or 70, I go, yeah, I like, um, you know, I like punk rock and reggae. So he bought me like Catch a Fire by the Bob Marley and he bought me like Sid Sings, you know, not my what, not my pick, but I guess it was somehow he figured out it was punk rock. So that's nice. Yeah. So, you, you know, he that was he, sweet. Yeah. So, um, you know, like so he, he you know, it was kind of like when those records came out in the 70s oh this is like more my thing it's not has nothing to do with my parents kind of thing and then yeah you, and then you were and then when you get into the sex missiles that's how i discovered the new york dolls because when you they got mentioned in like articles about the sex missiles or you know the new york dolls and you find out about them or jane county or wayne county and then you because they played with kiss and new york dolls or i was already into kiss by that time so, yeah and then you heard about new york dolls and wayne county and the Ramones and a lot of those bands that they play, like they, all oh, these guys are, or you, you, you would hear some band compared to the Ramones. They go, oh, who, who are the Ramones? You know, I'm going to check them out. Yeah. Or you go over to your friend's house and you would check out, you know, their record collection and, you know, listen to what they had. Yeah. So, yeah, well, it was, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, obviously it's, it's hard you know, when, you know, what, what we've experienced is an upheaval, like a cultural upheaval, a technological upheaval that make, you know, that, that, that pay, the industrial revolution pales in comparison to the digital revolution, which is yeah. displaced and confused and disoriented. And, and it's just turned everything upside down in a similar way to the, you know, the, what's dramatized and, Thomas Hardy's Tess of Durbavilles, you know, where the people are thrown off the land. All the ancient knowledge is suddenly redundant and irrelevant. And everybody has to go to the city and be chewed up by a factory, you know. And maybe everything that you learn to do, everything you learn how to do is suddenly irrelevant. And um, it's just capitalism, you know, allows this kind of displacement and trauma and it doesn't and it doesn't like it's like they're we're just supposed to we're just supposed to just deal you know and there's a lot of victims of this kind of traumatic upheaval you know because while you know at the same time that you know the technology changes so let's say like you learned how to do graphic design in school. Well, suddenly you're you're an idiot. You know, you wasted your life. You know, and uh, you know, or whatever it is. Oh, you own a gay bar. Well, you know what? There's grind grinder now. You're out of fucking luck. Fuck you. You know. I mean, that's kind of. Oh, you're a taxi driver. Well, now anybody can do your job, and you know, fuck you. You know. Um, so that's. Uh, so, but anyway, um, but along with this kind of industrial upheaval or like technological upheaval, you know, morality shifts according to the needs of capitalism, you know, so our morality is completely tailored to what, you know, the digital overlords or whoever the ruling class, you know, what, whatever they decide. I mean, you see that with slavery, you know, slavery was, was was uh, you know uh, it was whatever it was the like you know the basis of the american 
you know, a, a project, and then you know, it became immoral only when it became, only when it became political, like economically, you know, inefficient. And you see the same thing with marijuana. You know, marijuana was evil, and people went to jail for it, and now it's basically institutionalized. You know why? Because you know the digital people want everybody to smoke pot because it helps programming you know it's like it's good for programming it's good for it's good for you know you want that kind of inertia and that kind of laser focus that marijuana provides same with mushrooms suddenly everybody's dosing on mushrooms so morality is all like according to this stuff you know and so the thing you're describing with these records and the way that music it's it's you could repeat this conversation about like almost everything in our lives yeah. because, because of this digital thing that's happening. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, like during the COVID um, lockdown, you know, I read a lot of, first, I read a lot of Thomas Hardy and I, I think, I mean, that a lot of the late Victorian novels were all about the, you know, the, this, you know, the um, people getting displaced because, uh, you know, they, their jobs were kind of taken over by machinery or something, you know, like what, you know, what what took 20 people to do. Now they buy a machine and it's like, okay, now we got the machine that's going to take over. And it's like all these displacements, like um, in... in the, and all these people who knew how to do, you know, you think about like all, you know, just the amount of jobs that were, you know, have just don't you know didn't exist all of a sudden you know the people who were like you know i don't know dressing the the horses and you know or like whatever you know like yeah like all the whatever people banging out you know these products you know that said yeah and and yeah so anyway we we just see that a lot and you know musicians were the first you know we were the first to suffer you know they create they made music worthless and when something's, you know, when something's free, it's worthless. You know, that's essentially what happened to music, you know. Well, let me ask, okay, I got about time for one more question. So uh, this is kind of related, you know, like, I mean, Joseph Boy's, I mean, one of his main ideas was um, everyone's an artist, you know, like there's a democracy mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, there's a time where everyone can be an artist. That was like his revolutionary idea. And um he, he kind of envisioned the end of art like you envisioned the end of writing and he he, he was all into the de de demystification of art and the artist and i mean a lot of his art is like it's like you know fat and felt he used materials and and uh, he, he he thought like anybody can can do it but you know so someone Someone would say, well, you're elim eliminating commerce, you know, like D David Bowie was into boy. A lot of people are in Warhol. They were into boys. But if you de demystify art, you know, if everyone's an artist, you, you can't have commerce. You know, you're eliminating, com you know, art, the art world, there's, you know, the art world was, I mean, when graffiti artists came out, there was a million guys that did it or a thousand guys that did it. But why do we only know Herring, Basquiat, and Kenny Sharp? You know, because the, the art world artificially, you know, picked those guys and said, okay, you guys are going to be the ones that the, we're going to recognize. Yeah. And and uh, and then the same thing with music. You know, there's going to, you know, the the yeah music is it's it's hard to people i mean that's what you know these reissues come out and you're just like well why wasn't that, human expression the biggest band in the world you know that's a good example or new colony six or yeah these garage bands from the 60s that are just inc like they're amazing you know they're just incredible yeah, yeah, yeah but you know it's hard for because really, new bands that come along and and sell records i mean they got to be on tour they got to get an audience but you know, sometimes the the music industry picks one band. Okay, we're gonna pick you, Wet Leg. You're gonna be like the one band that you know, yeah, that gets get that pat that gets elevated. Yeah, in commerce. Even though you feel like, oh, hey, everybody can you can everyone can form a band. It's punk rock. You, you play three chords. You know, do your band. You know, uh, tour a lot. You know, see the world. 
What do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think that, um, yeah, the music thing, I mean, I already talked about how corrupt the music thing is. I mean, it's like, it's essentially a country club now and it's, uh, worse than top 40 ever was the, you know, the indie thing. It's just like this kind of payola publicity machine that, and the difference is there doesn't seem to be any relationship to like, you know, the people who are elevated are often like really, like really mediocre, like really just unremarkable. Uh, and, uh, and it's weird. It's weird. Yeah, and they don't even write the songs and they, they don't, you know, they, you know, they, they, there doesn't seem to be any performance ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah, I mean, I, it's just, I think it's worse probably now than it's ever been. And you really are, I, I mean, I really feel like in the same way that I think homeless people are kept on the street as a kind of warning system to stay in line, you know, they're kind of like, you know, in the Middle Ages, they put a head on a stake, you know, like, hey, you know, you know, it's a warning, you know, well, that's kind of what homeless people are. And I feel like these, the, you know, stardom and celebrity is this kind of human sacrifice and the people who are elevated, number one, there's this idea of elevating the most mediocre person because that gives everybody hope, you know, because it's like, oh, well, this is a lottery system and you can be as bad as that and still be, you know, whatever, you know, be a millionaire. But at the same time, you know, you look at, you know, Kanye West, he says some one stupid thing. And then, you know, suddenly he's, he, he's stripped, <laughs> he's stripped of everything. You know, that's, that's something that didn't used to be able to happen. You know, you used to be able to say some really stupid yeah, stuff. Yeah. But Kanye West, he's not gonna, he's not, I mean, he doesn't even have to perform and he's so rich now that he, he doesn't need to do anything now. Yeah, I know you're right. But you know what I mean? This idea of human sacrifice, it's like the Aztecs, you know, it's like, it's like, okay, you know, when human sacrifice would happen, they'd be like, well, you're great, you're great, you're great. Now we're going to rip your heart out, you know, in front of everybody. Okay. And that's kind of a little bit, you know, what's that's an aspect of this. But I mean, as far as the rock and roll thing goes, I just don't see this as rock and roll anymore. You know, this indie rock thing and this kind of festival thing. It's it's just something different. And I, I really think that something new is going to, going to, rise up i'm already seeing it you know i'm already seeing that people are no longer hypnotized by this kind of indie rock juggernaut which really is only for npr listeners and people who sit in cubicles you know it's not really this corporate this corporate kind of pitchfork thing it's just not it's not like it has no there's nothing under it you know it's 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 all like it's like uh it's yeah it's like the love boat you know it's like a it's like the love boat okay well on that note we have to wrap it up the book is against the written word ian savonius check out his website ian savonius.com you're you're gonna be doing a movie so you're gonna do show the movie now or what, what are you gonna do well, I've been showing the movie for about the last year, just uh, only like on, you know, in at theaters. So yeah, if anybody wants to show, if anybody wants to see the Lost Record, which is a really great film, it's made on sixteen millimeter by me and Alexandra Cabral, and uh, it's just a great film with a lot of great, a great, a lot of great underground stars. Well, thanks for talking to me. I mean, well, thanks for talking to me. It was really they're, fun. They're gonna they're gonna cut us off at any point here because that's uh, these that's uh, platforms way. are like are limiting. Uh, you know, we went we went twice as long as we usually do, but it was great. It was super fun to talk to you, and thanks okay, a lot. Okay, okay. Um, and thanks for your patience. Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. It worked out, and um, yeah, okay. It's um, I'll, I'll, we'll talk soon. I'll see you at the next show. Yeah, man. Take care, man. Bye. Take care. Uh, is that it? Okay.